Okay. So there we go. So probably I'll spend the first uh, uh, until the until 6 p.m. discussing or introducing you to the problem set or the second problem set. So pangalawa pa lang to. So lahat ng chapters na ako yung assigned. Kalimutan nyo na lahat ng mga nakasulat sa websites uh, as a website. So problem set one pa lang yung nabibigay ko and then I will finalize problem set number two. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow, ma-upload ko siya no? together with all the files that you'll need because I don't want you to uh, to spend uh, a lot of time uh, pre-processing data, running algorithms para lang makuha yung actual matrices na gagamitin nyo. But I'll give you a, a, a background about the problem that you will tackle dun sa problem set para makita nyo uh, para saan yung mga kinocompute nyo. Ano? Uh, let me uh, share my screen. How? <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, na. Screen. Okay, start broadcast. So in the second problem set, you will explore a uh, reconstruction of a function out of a convolution. So parang isa siyang the convolution process, which is a process that is very wide, uh, widely used in image processing. So you can think of it as how to manipulate, say, a blurry image and then take away the noise or the blur from it para makakuha kayo ng isang mas sharp na, na image. You know? So essentially, uh, but that will require two or three-dimensional convolutions, but we'll look at the baby problem yung pinaka simpleng uh, model para sa convolution. So, we'll just work with a function of a single variable para mas madali kasi kung 2D na, kung meron kang 2D image, so meron ka ng mga pixels na naka-save pag kinuha mo yung kanyang uh, yung kanyang uh, pag uh, tiningnan mo yung storage niya in a computer, it will be at least a three-dimensional array, uh one for each uh, of the primary colors kung RGB yung image, mas malaki pa four-dimensional kung uh, Ano nga ba yung isang color? CM, uh, cyan, magenta, black, and yellow. So CMBY, tama nga ba? Yun yung uh, isa pang color scheme. So you'll have four dimensions in your uh, in your array. So so one-dimensional convolution, so meron kang isang convolution operator, uh, curly A, that will act on functions or on continuous functions on an interval. So meron kang isang continuous function on an interval, Kapag ka pinag-undergo mo siya ng convolution process, ang ibibigay niya sa'yo pabalik ay isa uling continuous function. right? So basically, you take a continuous function little f uh, from the interval i1, and then it will be mapped to another function which we will denote, uh, denote by psi star f. Si psi star f is called the convolution of the function psi and little f. So in this particular operator, the operator curly A is dependent on the function psi. So fix the function psi, pumipili lang tayo ng isang continuous function F na ipapasa ko kay A. Tapos ang kukompute ni operator curly A ay ano yung convolution ng fixed function psi at saka ni function little f. Now, how does the convolution work? Well, the convolution function of, uh, of the function F together with psi is again another continuous function but it is defined this way. So you will take the integral of psi of y against f of x minus y with respect to y. All right? So ganito natin kinocompute yung convolution. So if it's a little bit very abstract for you, so you can just forget about it kasi i-discretize ko naman siya later. Pero the theory behind this is this. nag integrate ka lang ng product ng fixed function psi of y times a translation of the function f. And the integration will be done with respect to the variable in psi. So si psi is some function sa interval i2. So ibig sabihin si y ay nasa interval y2. So pag kinary out mo tong definite integral na to, ang matitira na lang na variable ay si x. And the variable x uh, lives in i3. Kasi nga yung function af ay isang function or isang continuous function on the interval i sub 3. Okay? So in the problem set, I will let you play with the following function psi. So si function psi I given by this guy. Okay? So si psi of x i binubo ng mga building blocks psi sub 0. Uh, and uh, the function psi sub 0 is defined such that 
psi sub zero of x minus n is uh, equal to, uh, let's finish. Yeah, is equal to this guy with the normalization constant C. So medyo marami nangyayari sa pagko-compute ni Psi. But you don't need to compute with these functions. I just want to, to give you the generic picture of what happens. So pag pinlot ko yung, conv uh, yung convolution function, yung fixed function dun sa convolution, si Psi, ito yung itsura niya. Ito si Psi on the interval a little bit uh, beyond negative one to one. Okay. So, ito yung i-convolve natin sa isang function f. Alright? So, everything's good so far? So, ito si psi. Now, gusto kong ipakita kung paano magre-reconstruct ng, ng convolution. I mean, now, if you know the, if you know the, uh, if you know the input function, you simply let it undergo the operation uh, curly A by computing that integral. So the integration against this function psi, and you're going to get the convolution AF. But that's not very challenging, and that's not usually the problem that arises in nature. Kasi pwede mong isipin si F siya yung, um, uh, siya yung actual image. And then si, uh, si psi, siya yung blurring operator. So when you take psi uh, convolution with, uh, with F, makukuha mo yung isang blurry image. So pwede mong tingnan yung convolution as ito yung nagblur. Uh, physically, pwede siya yung bigla kang gumalaw habang nagtitake ng picture. So instead of a uh, perfect representation of the physical reality, ay nakukuha mo ay isang blurred image. Okay? Now, to make it a little bit more mathematical, mag-consider tayo ng isang function f. So kalimutan muna natin yung, uh, yung image application niya. Pero yun yung motivation behind this example. Now, uh, if I consider... This function f over the interval 0 to 1. So inasum ko lang dito ay periodic yung function. Kaya meron pa akong f sub 0. Then the function little f is uh, the repeated pieces of f sub 0 na pinagdikit-dikit over the interval 0 to 1. But if we will only reside on the interval 0 to 1, then this is our function little f. So ito yung input function little f natin. So ito siya. Tapos, pag in-undergo, uh, pag pinag-undergo siya, undergo ko siya ng convolution. Oh, by the way, yung function psi nga pala natin. Balikan ko si psi. Si psi ay nakadepende sa isang constant, uh, little a. Uh, si little a, uh, in this example, is set to be 0 0.04. So, we'll stick to that. Si a ay 0 0.04. But you don't need to worry about this computation because I will give you exactly the matrices, ano? So, gusto ko lang bigyan ng context yung nasa problem set. So, don't worry if a lot of these things doesn't uh, make sense uh, right now. Okay? So, ito yung function f. Tapos, pag pinag-undergo ko siya ng convolution, ito yung makukuha kong result. Okay? So, you see, there's a little bit of difference here. So, instead of a, a very sharp and an image with sharp corners, we get something that is more smooth, right? Kasi nga yung epekto ito ng convolution operator natin na napaka-smooth. So, yun yung nangyayari. So, the forward problem is this. If you know the input little f, you can just compute the integral and you're gonna get uh, psi convolution f. All right? Pero hindi ito yung gusto nating uh, gusto nating i-address. Gusto kong i-address is, if I have limited knowledge about the convolution, can I recover the function little f? So I really need to look at to find the inverse operator. Pero itong operator na to ay hindi invertible. So ibig sabihin, hindi natin just marireverse yung process. Or kung invertible man yung process, ang hirap niyan. Kasi integration, how do you solve an integral equation? And that is sometimes more difficult than a differential equation. So the idea is, can we numerically or using data points or data measurements from the output, can we recover the input? And what is the effect of noise, and how can we mitigate that? That's the thing that you will uh, that you will explore in problem set number one or problem set number two. Okay. So the idea is ganito. Since this is a continuum problem, gusto ko siyang discretize. Gusto ko siyang represent by a discrete set of operate uh, a discrete number of operations and a discrete set of data points. So kaya ang ginawa ko ay yung convolution operator nito. Right? Instead of the actual integral, I use quadrature rules. 
in approximate ko to using uh, good old familiar quadrature formulas from numerical integration. And then the right-hand side, G, so ito ay magiging discrete, uh, discretized sum. And then the right-hand side will be replaced by a discrete set of data measurements. Okay. So in essence, so I have here a long derivation, but if you will keep track, uh, if you will be patient enough and read this uh, this entire thing, right? Makukuha mo si equation 3.11. Meron kang matrix A, tas meron kang vector F. Ano si vector F? Ito lamang ay mga data readings, function values ng mga discretization points along the x-axis. So we are on the interval negative, uh, I think we are on the interval 0 to 1. Yun yung function na, na pinakita ko kanina, yung uh, conditional function na ang itsura ay box and then may rectangle, right? So hatiin ko ngayon yung x-axis into several into several points. Okay, I just forgot how many points I used, but I'll tell you that later. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I used 64 points uh, from 0 to 1 para dun sa discretization. And then for each of these 64 points, I computed their images under F. So si F, ang laman niya, si vector F, ang laman niya ay F of X1, F of X2, hanggang F of X sub 64. Mga function values siya nung mga discretization points ko. And then I derived using quadrature formulas nga kung ano yung itsura ni matrix A. Para ang convolution process ngayon ay model ko as simple matrix multiplication. I have what we call the propagator matrix A. Tapos 64 by 64 yan, multiply ko siya by matrix little f, uh, by vector little f, and then I'll get a vector G. Si vector G, hopefully, ito yung vector ng laman ay yung mga function values under the convolution. until psi uh, convolution xn. So that's essentially how the forward problem will, will work. So you have the propagator matrix say I computed it for you, so don't worry how to derive it. Kinompute ko na yan, ibibigay ko lang sa inyo yung data, ano yung itsura ni A, tapos meron kang discretize. Kung meron kang function f, kahit ano pang function f, you can generate a random set of, uh, a random uh, vector f, tapos, uh, carry out mo lang yung matrix multiplication, makukuha mo yung approximate para sa convolution uh, ng given function psi at saka nung iyong made-up function f by simply matrix multiplication. Okay? But again, the challenge here is to reconstruct a given function f from known measurements of the right-hand side. So essentially, ang gusto kong gawin nyo ay ito. So ito yung resulta ng convolution. Ito yung uh, psi convolution F, right? Tapos meron niya mga data points. Yung mga data points na yon, yun yung mga measurements sa bawat isang exabyte. So dun sa data na ipapasa ko sa inyo o ibibigay ko sa inyo, ang, uh, yung mga exabyte, yung mga discretization points or abscissas, sila ay nakasave sa vector na data X. Tapos yung mga function values, yung exact function values ng psi star f ay nakasave sa vector data y. Kaya pag pinagawa nyo kay MATLAB yung scatter ng data x kama data y, ibibigay niya sa'yo ay ito. Yung mga dots dito sa figure na yan. So the challenge here is, can we reconstruct the function little f coming from this 64 points. Okay. So ito ngayon, di yung data y na yan, yan yung function, yan yung, uh, yan yung vector, yung right-hand side vector g nyo dun sa linear system AF equals g. So meron kang AF equals g, given na si g, siya yung mga data points na yan, yung mga data y points na yan. So kailangan mo lang isolve itong linear system na to. Okay? Uh, is everything uh, making sense so far? Paramdam nga kay guys. <clears throat> Hi, sir. Okay, good. So, yeah. Meron akong tatlong ipapagawa sa inyo. Una, as a baseline, gusto kong gawin nyo yung tinatawag natin na naive reconstruction. Okay? So, yung naive reconstruction ay i-assume natin na perfect yung ating data. 
And then we just do matrix inversion here. Okay. So of course, that naive reconstruction will just be F equals A inverse G if A is invertible. And luckily, A is invertible. Makikita nyo na may A inverse. Pero if in, in some other applications, if A is non-invertible, if A is not even square to begin with, the naive reconstruction would be F equals A pseudo inverse G. So I think tinatawag natin na naive reconstruction. Okay? And then, so that, uh, from here, you will get a reconstruction for the function f. Pero makukuha yung vector little f, which is the product of the inverse or the pseudo inverse of a times g, will be again a, a vector. It's a 64 by 1 vector representing our estimates for the function values under the function f ng bawat isang discretization point. Okay? So essentially, pag pinlot nyo yun, ito yung makukuha nyo. Ito yung F na nakuha ko sa naive reconstruction. Tapos para makita ko, ah, anong itsura nito? Kasi it's just a bunch of points, right? Now, pwede nyo ipa-plot kay MATLAB, uh, ipa-interpolate yung, um, ipa yung, yung function F, right? So, diretso naman to. So, this guy is obtained by using scatter plot. Uh, scatter lang nga pala yung command kay MATLAB. Scatter ng data X at saka yung F na nakuha nyo. Tawagin natin itong F sol N halimbawa. F sol N yung, uh, yung vector na na-compute nyo mula sa naive reconstruction. Okay? To make a more meaningful insight out of this discrete data points, pabayaan ko mag-interpolate ngayon si MATLAB. And I can do that automatically by asking MATLAB to do this. Okay. Uh, data X, then F sol M. So, wala halos pinagkaiba yung command, right? So, uh, yung pagplot lang yung ginamit nyo, i-coconnect the, dot the dots lang ni MATLAB. Then, this is the reconstruction that you will get. And uh, you can visually compare this to what our uh, expected solution is. Laging ganito yung baseline. Eh. Nagsasimulate tayo. Kino uh, meron tayong pre-calculated pre uh, test case para alam natin nag-work ba as intended yung ating, uh, yung ating uh, algorithm o yung ating program na sinulat. So to get at least a visual uh, or, um, a visual uh, uh, say analysis or a visual uh, commentary on how accurate the solution is, pwede mong ipa-plot or i-plot sa isang figure itong uh, interpolated graph at saka yung graph ng true solution. And this is what you'll get. Oops. Okay. So ito yung galing sa naive reconstruction. Of course, it's not perfect because here it's a little, uh, parang ano, binarat ko to kasi 64 points lang yung ginamit ko. I could have done or I could have used 128 data points. I could have used more uh, accurate uh, quadrature rules. Pero just for the sake of illustration, this is what I get. And this is, uh, I think this is still good because I used a 64 by 64 matrix to approximate a continuum problem, an integration problem. So hindi na masama, kumbaga, itong nakuha kong approximate. And you see that the algorithm is really, or really tried to match the actual function little f. Okay? So that is the naive reconstruction. Pero ito yung ideal. Pero hindi ito yung nangyayari sa tunay na buhay. Why? Because we don't often get access to exact data. So solving A, F equals G is nearly impossible. Because the right-hand side are always born or almost always born out of real-life measurements. And so they will be tainted by measurement noise. So essentially, I'll have A, F equals G plus E instead of G. Where E is the noise vector, or E could be the vector consisting of the measurement errors. So essentially, the norm of E is usually uh, very, very small. Usually, a noise na ginagamit natin is about 1 or 5% of the size of G. So usually, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the problem set, actually, that I'll be giving you, I will ask you to generate a random vector of um, relative size 1%. So, because when you need to find E such that the norm of E 
the L2 norm of E is 1% of the norm of the actual true data G. Okay. So, uh, pag-isipan niyo yung trick. Kasi kay MATLAB, pag nagpa-rand ka, tapos ilalagay mo dito gano'ng kalaki, halimbawa M by N. So, pag tinipe mo kay MATLAB yung rand of M, N, magbibigay siya sa iyo ng isang M by N matrix na ang laman ay mga random numbers uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. Okay? Pero ang gusto ko, mag-generate kayo ng E na ang size ay equal dito. So, do the math. How do you, you can start with this and how can you scale the random vector that you got so that the resulting uh, noise vector will have size 0.01%. So, maghanap lang kayo ng uh, multiplier, say, alpha dito or lambda dito para yung uh, lambda times this guy ang kanyang uh, ang kanyang relative size uh, ang kanyang uh, ang kanyang L2 norm ay equal sa 1% known norm ng right hand side. Okay? So the, the the math is not that hard, you know. But essentially that's what uh, what uh, what will do. That's what uh, happens in uh, in the real world. Hindi perpekto yung right hand side nating sinosolve. Oh by the way, here um usually pala kinocompute natin yung uh, yung how uh, the relative error Okay, in this particular case, uh, yung F-comp, ito yung nasolve ko mula sa naive reconstruction. Pag kinuha ko yung uh, L2 relative error, meaning this is the, the residual. This is what we computed. This is the exact value. Get their differences as vector. Then compute their L2 norm. Divided by the L2 norm of the exact solution, you'll get the percentage error. So visually, you can say, yes, sir, the, uh, the algorithm is trying and... Knowing that it is a cheap uh, estimate, then we still got uh, we still got good results, you know. And in particular, if you want to quantify the accuracy, you can say, ah, sir, fourteen percent error. A little bit bad when you look at fourteen percent, but visually, parang medyo okay na siya, no? Especially for those applications that are not too sensitive to errors or yung hindi sila nangangailangan ng napakaliit na mga error. Okay. Pero yun nga, ito yung perfect case. So what if we gener we add noise to the right hand side well i simulated that as well so nag uh, nag generate ako ng 1% noise in add ko siya dun sa right hand side and then you see here in uh, figure a pinlot ko ngayon yung mga original exact data tapos yung data pag dinagdagan ko na ng ng noise all right so the blue dots are the noisy data ito yung mga points sa g plus e Tapos yung, yung orange, sila lang yung mga G. And you see that there is or there are almost uh, no differences between the noisy and the exact data points. Parang konting-konti lang. And this is understandable because 1% lang yung total error all throughout the interval 0 to 1. And then if you want to look at it in the continuum, parang ganito yung nangyari. Yung kulay orange, siya yung exact uh, output ng convolution. Tapos parang nagpumili lang ako ng mga points na super lapit dun sa, dun sa curve. Sila yung ginamit ko ng mga noisy data. So it's a little bit of a hit and miss in the measurements. So pero nakita nyo ang liit lamang nung pinagbago ng right-hand side compared to the actual data. And yet, when you do reconstruction from the noisy data or when you do naive reconstruction from the noisy data, so again, you will solve F, but this time, this function F, will be uh, A inverse or A pseudo inverse. So, gawin ko ng pseudo inverse para mas general kasi ang pseudo inverse naman ng invertible matrix ay yung inverse pa rin, yeah? This would be A pseudo inverse times G plus error. Yan yung naive reconstruction from noisy data. Okay? Now, let's look at what results I got. So, here is what I got. At ko yung nakuha kong reconstruction mula sa noisy data. And this is, uh, there's a very huge or very significant uh, uh, reduction of accuracy here. Kasi parang kanina, halos nandito lang yung mga oscillations dun sa triangular part, dun sa papataas sa hypotenuse part. Pero you see here, there are more pronounced oscillations around that area. And then there is more, or there are more, uh, more wiggles over here and some outliers over there. So parang na, nawala yung uh, nawala yung uh, 
nawala yung uh, accuracy na meron tayo kanina. And you see, this is just due to 1% noise. That little noise caused a very huge and significant uh, uh, transformation of our solution. Well, if you want to quantify it, you can you can look at two points, right? So first, you can double check whether um, mm -hmm. actually, hindi ko na pala siya nilagay. Pero pag sinod niyo yung residual, yung relative error mula dun sa reconstruction, you will see that yung AF, uh, sorry, yung A F noise, tawagin natin F noise, yung nakuha nyo dito yung solution. Yung AF noise minus G plus E. Okay. Kunin nyo yung L2 norm nito over G plus E. Meaning, what is the relative error supposing that G plus E is a perfect data or is a, is a perfect measurement, right? So, makikita nyo ito napakaliit. Ibig sabihin, wala naging problema dun sa pag invert ng function A o nung uh, matrix A. Kasi ang ganda nung match ng ating function, uh, ang ganda nung match ng reconstruction natin at saka nung right-hand side, nung noisy right-hand side. So that means no problem with the inversion. But the thing is we are not reconstructing from G plus E. We want our AF to match only G. Kasi alam nga natin si E, Galing lang yun sa noise or sa measurement error. So the best case scenario is that F noise will be close to the actual F that we have. And if you think about it, that should be the case because E is a very small vector. It, it has only size 1% of the right-hand side. So dapat yung noise vector na yun, dapat kakaunti lamang yung naging epekto dun sa function, uh, dun sa solution F noise. So dapat yung F noise natin, which I denoted here by F epsilon, right, ay dapat malapit dun sa F nating na compute. But that's not the case. This relative error computation shows that there is a 24% relative difference between the, the actual solution or the solution from perfect data and the solution from the noisy data. So meron 24% difference between the two solutions. So that means... The 1% noise in the right-hand side caused 24% change in the solutions that we obtain. And so that is why it is understandable that if we compare the noisy solution to the exact solution, ang laki ng relative error. 28% ngayon, yung layo niya dun sa exact error. Okay? So, uh, yeah, halos na doble yung uh, relative error with respect to the exact solution. Right? So yun yung problema. Uh, I think here I plotted the uh, I plotted the solution or the reconstruction from noisy data and the reconstruction from noise-free data so that you will see the difference, right? At yung pinaka naalala ko, eh. uh, yung noisy data nagcost ng tremendous and pronounced oscillations along the hypotenuse of the supposed uh, right triangular part of our function little f. Pero wala yun kanina dun sa uh, noise-free data. Okay? Now, yeah, that's the problem. Now, ang gusto ko ang makita ay paano natin to mamimitigate. Para maubos yung klase ko ngayon dito pa lang sa discussion ng problem set number two. So, paano natin siya mamimitigate? How can we, uh, uh, how can we, para maligtad yung legend ng lines? Um... Uh, Dito ba yun, uh, Pop, sa 3.9? O kanina pa tong message na to? Sir, nang ante. Patas na nang ante, sir. Yung, yan ba, sir? Ah, yeah. Kaya It's naka-ano siya. Kaya merong pigtail. <laughs> Kailangan ko siyang i-delete. Right? So, yeah. Hindi ko siya na-edit. Na, na, Nakapipaste ko mula dun sa kabila. Pero tama. Baligtad yung ano. Baligtad yung label. Yung green yung uh, exact date. Ah, yung uh, actual solution. Si green. Actually, maling-mali yung, yung label. Si Green yung exa ay yung uh, true data. Okay? Now, so, uh, paano natin itong mamimitigate? Pwede nyo itong imitigate yung effect ng error by using the L-curve. Alright? So, essentially here, ayun yung gusto kong ipakita. So, um, so una, magna-naive reconstruction kayo from noise-free data. Then, second, you will generate a noise vector E. 
na 1% ng actual data. So iba-iba kayo ng noise. Basta pare-parehas tayo na 1% yung kanyang uh, measurement. Tapos i-magre-reconstruct kayo using the noisy data. And then you will show pictures para makita ko kung ano yung difference. Magka-quantify kayo kung compute yung mga L2 relative error. Pero hindi doon matatapos yung boxing kasi kailangan pa nating tumingin ng mga methods kung paano siya mamimitigate. And from our discussions uh, way back when, ano, so may natutunan tayo yung L-curve routine. Okay? So para mamitigate yung solution. So instead of simply solving AF equals G plus epsilon as F noise equals A pseudo inverse times uh, G plus E, Okay, pwede natin kunin yung Tikhonov solution with respect to the regularization parameter alpha to be alpha identity plus A conjugate transpose A. Tapos kukunin ko yung inverse nito times A conjugate transpose G plus E. Right? So this is what we call the, reg the regularized solution or a regularized solution. Regularized solution. This is an example of a Tikhonov solution. So Tikhonov solution. But this is dependent on the choice for alpha. And I guess we have uh, studied this before. Kung masyadong malaki yung alpha, uh, ibig sabihin, magsasuffer yung accuracy. Pag super liit naman ni alpha, mag, uh, magiging sensitive naman yung ating solution. So we need to find the perfect balance between uh, the perfect balance between accuracy and sensitivity or stability of our solution, right? So, ipapakita ko ngayon or mag-share ako sa inyo. So, i-share ko sa inyo yung data. Bibigay ko sa inyo si matrix A, si uh, vector data X, the discretization points, si data Y, which are the function values from the output function. Tapos, ano pa ba? Bibigay ko rin yung exact solution, uh, F, tapos uh, yung vector ng mga function values under the actual solution F. So wala na kayong masyadong i-compute aside from uh, the actual solution. Doon na kayo sa matrix inversion papasok. Kaya mahaba yung problem set number two. At least mahaba yung instructions. Kasi kinento ko uli yung mga sinabi ko ngayon a little bit. Ano yung instructions doon. So uh, yeah, you will read that in the problem set uh, questionnaire. So yung third part ay kailangan nyo maghanap ng alpha kasi gusto kong ipakita nyo na merong silbe yung regularization. Okay? And for that, I will share with you. Uh, let me just go back to Zoom. I will share with you uh, a MATLAB code para sa L-curve. Uh, parang hindi ko pa ito na-share sa inyo or na-demo before. Ano? So let me just uh, go to my MATLAB screen. Galakoy na yung share button. Let me share my screen. Ah, wait. Kailangan ko i-click yung share. Okay. Yan, so makikita niyo sinusulat ko yung problem set. Hindi ko siya natapos kanina. Medyo mahaba yan. So, probably hanggang number 10 yan. Pero I'll go here. Uh the L curve uh, problem. So dito sa L-curve problem, or by the way, ganito yung mangyayari. Ganito yung final output na, uh, yung medyo final output na gusto kong makita niya. So ito yung, uh, kung nakikita niyo, hopefully, itong figure na nag-pop up, ito yung mula sa naive reconstruction. Alright? So ito yung nakita natin kanya. So i-recreate nyo to. Tapos, gusto ko rin makita yung solution mula sa noisy data. So ito naman yung makikita niyo. Dahil pala magkakasin laki sila para ma-compare natin ng maayos. Okay. Uh -huh. Tapos pag nag L curve, uh, pag nag Tikhonov solution na kayo nag L curve kayo para dun sa optimal alpha, dapat yung solution yung makukuha ay ganito, nasa figure 5. And you compare figure 2 and figure 5, ang laki nung naging improvement ng solution mula sa noisy data. So mind you dun sa number 5 noisy data yung ginamit ko diyan. So kasi nga, um, yeah, tapos naghanap lang ako ng optimal alpha para dun sa reconstruction ng solution. So that's how we mitigate uh, the effect of noise. So kung hindi nyo alam yung true solution, kung naive solution, kung naive, naive reconstruction lang yung ginamit nyo from the noisy data, you will get figure 2, yung nasa gitna. And uh, 
marami siyang oscillations. Ang laki ng epekto ng noise. Pero kung nag-regularize ka, ang makukuha mo ay yung nandun sa figure 5, yung nasa pinakakanan, which is much similar, uh, much more similar to the actual solution. Okay? So, paano ko nahanap yung alpha na nag-generate nitong figure number 5? Ginamit ko tong L-curve routine na nandito sa L-curve sample. Okay? So, ide-demo ko lang, i-share ko sa inyo itong code na to, so don't worry, kasama to ng package para sa problem set number 2. So, mangyayari ay kailangan yung i-initialize yung mga problem parameters. So, ano si matrix A, matrix B, and so on. So, let me just clear the memory. Okay. Tapos, halimbawa, paglaruan natin itong sample na to. Okay. So, I have 0 0.15, 0 0.1. So, meron ang matrix A ng itsura ay ito, halimbawa. Pero dun sa data na ipapasa ko sa inyo, given na yung matrix A, ano? yung matrix A dun sa convolution problem. So 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.1, and then second row, 0 0.16, 0 0.1, then third row, 2.01, 1.3. Tapos ito yung right-hand side, si B. Tapos mag-generate ako ng noise vector. So kailang ko mag-generate ng isang random vector of size the same as... Uh, B, right? So, size ni B. So, yung size B, bibigay niyo yung dimensions ng vector B na meron tayo in line number 6. Papasa niya yun dun sa loob ng RAND. So, alam na ngayon ni RAND command kung gaano kalaking matrix or vector of random numbers yung ibibigay niya. Pero yung, uh, pero yung size ng random vector ay... Ah, pero yung random vector E so far ang size uh, siya ay consisting of random numbers uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. Gusto ko ngayon ay... Ano nga yung gusto kong mangyari? Gusto kong ang size niya ay halimbawa 1%. So I'll have E generated that way. Tapos gusto ko ang norm niya. Uh, so mag-introduce ako ng multiplier alpha so that yung norm niya ay equals to 1% ng norm ni B. So, ibig sabihin si alpha dapat ay equal sa 0.01 norm ni B over norm ni E. So, ayan. Ginawa ko na yung math para sa inyo. Ano. So, gawin ko siya dito. So, si E ay gagawin kong i-update ko yung value ni E. Siya ay magiging E equals 0.01. So, that's the percentage, the relative size, times norm ni B divided by norm ni E nung original E ma-update siya tapos there we go tapos ito na alam ko na ngayon yung bagong um, yung bagong vector eco noise vector eco 1% na yung kanyang noise tapos i-update ko yung right hand side vector instead of B gagawin ko siyang B plus E right uh, I hope tama yung algebra ko nakakaya kasi recorded Oh, yes, uh, Ben Paul. Sir, based sa pag-update niya na ang value ng E, uh, parang size lang dapat to. Parang ito yung dapat i-multiply sa existing na E dapat, di ba? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, okay. dapat may times E pa ito. Thank you. And then, ayan, makukuha ko na yung vector E. Alright. Tapos B plus E. Tapos medyo nakwento ko nga sa inyo, pang mayaman yung L-curve. Kasi kukompute natin to. Uh, Kukompute natin sa lahat ng alpha ito. Kasi um, ayaw natin mag-optimization. Ano, mag Kung kaya naman natin mag-brute force, why not? Mas madali siya. No? Maliit lang naman yung matrix A. So I, I don't think the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the L-curve will be a big problem. Magkakaproblema kayo malamang dun sa problem set kasi mas malaki yung data nyo. Yung A nyo ay 64 by 64. So in this particular case, sa line 12, nag-create ako ng alpha vector consisting of numbers starting from 10 to the negative 16, which is usually the machine precision. Anything before uh, below 10 to the minus 16 is almost negligible. So start ko na yung iteration ko, yung alpha values ko from 10 to the negative 16. Tapos ang step size ko ay 10 to the minus 6, papunta kay 1. So ito yung candidates ko para kay alpha, so optimal alpha. So if I run this, pag niran ko yan, I hit F9 after highlighting that line. May kita nyo sa workspace, meron akong 1 by 1 million 1. So, ibig sabihin, nag-generate ako ng 1 million 1 candidates for alpha. 
Pagka ginawa nyo na yung exercise tapos sobrang tagal, hindi na kayo makapagantay kasi 64 by 64 yung matrix yung paglalaruan, pwede nyo li uh, liitan itong step size. Pwede nyo gawing 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 4. Uh, pero yun nga, marami kayong mamimiss na posibleng maging near optimal value ni alpha. So, try nyo muna kung kaya ng 10 to the minus 6, 1 million, 1 candidates, pero kung hindi talaga, paliitin nyo na lang siya. Right? So, tapos, sa bawat isang alpha, sa laman ng alpha vector na yun, compute ko yung Tikhonov solution. Right? So, meron ng X test, uh, inverse. Uh, so, this is what I wrote kanina. Kaya lang ngayon, yung alpha values ay nanggagaling dun sa candidate vector ko para sa mga alphas. And then, for each iteration, I will solve for the solution norm of the, solu the Tikhonov solution X test. And then I will also compute for the residual norm para makita ko gano'ng kaganda yung approximation ko. And then kasi kanina, nirarun ko yung sa problem nyo, eh, umaabot ng mga 5 minutes yata yung inabot niya. Medyo nainip ako. So sabi ko, para malaman ko lang na nag-work, medyo paranoid ako yan. No? Para malaman ko lang na nag-work yung for loop, mag-preprint ako ng iteration done after every iteration. Para lang ko nasa pang ilang iteration na ako. Nakikita ko sa command window kung saan yan. That pala nilagay ko na yung progress bar na, sin na, na, na download ko somewhere. Pero anyway, probably for next time. Tapos, ang mangyayari ngayon, so it's a solve niya yan. Remember sa L-curve, kailangan natin gumawa ng isang curve. Yung L-curve na yon ay graph ng residual norm comma solution norm. So the solution norm as a function of the residual norm. And hopefully, we will get an L-looking curve. Tapos, pag nakuha natin yung L-looking curve na yon pipiliin natin yung alpha na magbibigay sa atin ng corner point. However, yung alpha na yon ay nakatago. Hindi natin yon makikita dun sa graph. Kasi yung graph natin ay residual norm versus solution norm for each alpha. So kailangan kong i-trace kung ano man yung alpha. Well, medyo meron akong band-aid solution para makuha yung alpha na yon. Yun yung nasa lines 28 to 32. Uh, you may... Uh, I'll just suggest that you look at the documentation for each of these lines. Pero ang mahalaga dito ay yung line 29. Ang ginagawa ni line 29, ibibigay niya sa akin yung L curve na naka full screen. Ang gagawin ko ngayon, mag-click ako ng point doon sa graph na yon. Tapos automatically hahanapin ng lines 29 to 32 sino yung alpha na nagbigay ng corner point na yon. So kung ano yung corner point na kinlik ko, ibibiga uh, i-retrieve ni MATLAB kung ano yung alpha na nagbigay sa akin ng point na yon tapos yun yung tatawagin niyang alpha optimal or alpha opt. Tapos yun yung magiging, gagamitin natin, yun yung i-declare natin na near optimal alpha, yun yung i-report natin as our Tikhonov solution. Right? So I just have a bunch of other, uh, other, um, other lines here, pero makita nyo naman dito kung ano yung kanyang ginagawa. Right? So let me run, run this uh, with this uh, problem na meron tayo. Hopefully, super bilis lang nito. So I'll run it. Okay. Medyo matagal pa rin pala. Nakakadagdag kasi rin ng oras yung, ano, yung pag-run. So nasa 100,000 level pa lang ako. So uh, any questions so far with the code? There are certain parts that I skipped. You can look at the documentation for, for those that I skipped. Of course, meron na nga yung mga paraan paano mahanap si alpha without going through uh, the L-curve. Ang ginagamit ko talaga ay Morozov routine. Pero optimization yun. I don't want to go uh, into the details of that optimization. Meron ding nag-minimize ng curvature ng L-curve. Uh, you can find several papers uh, relating to the search for the optimal alpha. Pero yung mga engineers talaga, ito yung paborito nila. Kasi ang dali nitong gawin. Especially if you have uh, parallel computing, Dapat pala pinaralize ko to para nagamit ko yung ilang cores ba tong computer ko? Apat ba or walo? So para yung walong CPUs na yun nag-work ng sabay-sabay kasi independent naman yung pagko-compute nila nung, uh, nung uh, Tikhonov solution. Or you can also do GPU computing para naman yung mga high-end high graphics card nyo ay hindi lang pang gaming, magamit din for computing. Ano? At least si MATLAB ready for GPU and parallel computing. Sa so, na, nasa 900k na, patapos sa siya. Pero ang tagal pa rin. Um, dapat mabilis lang pa. 
Okay, there we go. And then it will give us this plot. All right. So ngayon, pipiliin mo ngayon ano yung point. So pag nag-hover ka dun sa figure, may lalabas na, anong tawag nga dito? Crossbow or something. Nakalimutan ko yung tawag. Pero itong parang target na to. So piliin niyo yung corner ng L-looking curve, right? So here I have here. Actually, it's not always the, uh, we are choosing the, oh yeah, thank you, Ben Paul, crosshair. So we are choosing the, uh, we're choosing the, the corner because that represents the inflection point. Kung saan hindi na nagiging significant yung drops or solution norm habang lumalaki yung residual norm. So basically, if you go here, hindi na ganun ka worth it yung pagbaba ng solution norm with respect to the increase in the residual norm. But if you really, if you are really conscious about the um about the sensitivity of your solution, you can just pick ano yung acceptable sa yon na residual norm. So if you look at here, the bottom, uh, the x-axis, nandyan yung residual norm. So pwede ka dyan pumili. Ano yung acceptable na residual norm? Halimbawa, acceptable naman sa yung 10% error. So 10 to the negative 1. So 10% yan. So acceptable sa yung 10% error, then ito na yung piliin mo to give you the alpha. Right? Kasi kung kaya mo namang i-sacrifice hanggang 10%, you'll get the best or the smallest solution norm possible, right? Pero if you want to get the near optimal one, the medyo uh, parang wala na masyadong significant improvement on the solution norm, pwedeng ito yung piliin natin, etong corner na ito. Mag Pero super ganda pa rito nung, uh, nung, nung residual norm kasi between 10 to the negative 3 and 10 to the negative 2 pa siya. And then the, the solution norm is small. It's already at 1.4. So essentially, tanggalin ko yung annotations, so yung crosshair, uh, i-click click, uh, dadalhin ko lang dito, target lang, tapos click. You click on that on that particular point and then after you click, okay? Lalabas itong figure na pinan-check para ginawa ko lang to para makita ko tama ba yung na-click ko. All right? So makita niyo, ah, all right, almost near the midpoint naman yung na-click yung na-click ko. All right? So you can minimize the figures and go back to your MATLAB. Uh Ah, you can go back to your MATLAB, uh, to your MATLAB um, screen or command window. Medyo may error siya kasi yung lines 44 to 46, and, uh, sorry, 45 and 46, nakadesign siya sana para sa, nakadesign siya doon sa, what do you call this? Nakadesign siya para doon sa, para doon sa, Convolution problem, all right? Kaya meron ka noisy data, etc. May mga pinakompute ako sa kanya. So that's the actual solution or that's the solution that we got. But the relative error with respect to the noisy data is 2.51 times 10 to the negative 3. Pero pag sinold natin yung actual, uh, pag sinold natin yung actual system, so tawagin kong X, uh, kailangan ko pala itong i-run ulit. Para makita ko yung epekto nung, nung solution. Kung malapit ba talaga yung X alpha natin dun sa true solution. Right? Ibalik ko lang yung, uh, yung B para mawala yung epekto ng noise. Tapos computing ko yung X true. Dito na lang sa command window. Si X true ay gawin kong inverse ni A times yung walang uh, yung noise-free data. So I'll get, uh, sorry. Uh, what's the problem? Bakit hindi siya nag-compute? Ano si B? Uh, si A, I... Ah, sorry. Hindi pala, hindi nga pala, hindi invertible si A kasi rectangular siya. So kailangan P in yung gagamitin ko. Or instead of P in, mas gusto ni MATLAB yung A backslash. Para siya na yung pipili ng pinaka-mabilis pinaka or pinaka-efficient na algorithm para dun sa naive reconstruction, be it the pseudo-inverse, be it other inversion procedures. So if you do that, so X true will be computed. And then tingnan natin, pwede natin tingnan yung norm ng X true. Hopefully nakikita nyo yung tinatype ko dun sa command window, nasa pinaka-baba nung, nung screen. Minus yung X alpha na galing dun sa L curve. Okay. Divided by norm ng x true. Para makita natin yung relative difference between the true solution 
and the uh, solution x alpha, right? So here we go. There, uh, though here, medyo malaki pa rin, 19% pa rin yung difference between the two. But it will be, uh, it would be much catastrophic kung hindi tayo nag, uh, kung hindi tayo nag Tikhonov, kung hindi tayo nag L curve, right? Kasi tingnan natin. Uh, let's see. So pag sinolv ko si, okay. So, is generate ko lang, lagyan ko uli ng noise para makita ko yung solution na may noise. So, x noise equals a backslash b. Tapos kunin ko yung norm ng x noise over x true. Okay. Kita nyo, kapag ka hindi ako nag-regularized, yung solution na nakuha ko is 250% away from the true solution. Ah, sorry. Minus x alpha. Oh, no. Malito. Dapat ito ay x noise minus x true. Yeah. About 230%. So, super laki nung na-improve. From 230% relative difference from the true solution, it was now down to, uh, how, many, how much is that? About 20%, right? About 19%. So, that's the effect of the L curve. So, yun yung gusto kong explore nyo dun sa problem set. So medyo matagal lang yung pagraran pero gusto ko kasing hands-on may experience nyo yung regularization process. Okay? Now, I will give you this, uh, uh, I'll give you two files, lcurve sample.m, and then I'll give you the data file, conv.data255.math. Right? So bibigyan ko naman kayo ng description dun sa problem set kung ano, kung ano yung laman ng conv.data255. Right? Any questions so far with this? Uh... Okay. Now, if you will run into problems, siguro we can, uh, if you want, we can meet on Monday. I can, uh, kaya lang, uh, siguro sometime in the afternoon, uh, we can, if you have some questions, I can uh, I can uh, meet with you para, para sagutin yung mga questions, especially if it, this is just about the MATLAB code. Okay? Now, isang oras yung nakain ko dun sa pag-discuss nitong uh, gagamitin niya sa problem set, but I hope that helps para medyo mas magaan yung magiging problem set niyo. Okay? Now, I guess uh, at this point, gusto ko uling mag, uh, I mean, at this point, gusto ko nang simulan yung classification at saka yung uh, uh clustering methods uh i hope you already read the uh, the introductory materials uh that i uh, that i uh, assigned to you uh for last time okay uh but before we proceed do you guys have any questions about that let me stop sharing muna but i can see your uh, your dps okay so i hope that's uh, pretty straightforward you know? so dun sa unang uh, dun sa unang uh, file nag-discuss lang siya about uh, different kind of norms and then different kinds of distances. So merong Minskowski distance, which is basically your L LP distance. Special cases niya yung Manhattan or the taxi cab distance. Tapos meron tayong usual Euclidean distance, which is just the L2 norm between the difference between two vectors. Tapos Shebyshev uh, distance, which is basically the maximum between differences uh, the maximum absolute difference between components. And then merong Hamming distance. Sanay na sanay si Pops dyan sa Hamming distance. Uh, basically, ginagamit siya for binary, almost usually for binary data. Pero binibilang niya kasi ilang, uh, ilang characters hindi nagmamatch yung character at saka position. Tapos kukunin niya yung percentage error. So uh, I think that's also nice. Uh, pero hindi siya madalas ginagamit, ano? Uh, unless you're doing textual analysis or uh, uh, or a binary comparison. Uh, though, actually, mahirap din siya sa textual analysis kasi sa Hamming distance, sama ba, Ben Paul? Dapat same yung length nung, uh, nung kinocompare mo. Yes, sir. So, yun. Pag magko-compare ka ng dalawang words na hindi magkasing haba, hindi na mag-work yung Hamming distance unless imamodify mo siya na mag, uh, mag assign ka ng value dun sa mga missing characters. Ano? So, and then you also have cosine similarity, cosine distance, and then you have the Pearson R correlation factor, and so on. 
Now, these are very important, especially in classification and uh, clustering algorithms. Kasi sa classification, sa clustering algorithms, nag-rely tayo dun sa pag-measure ng distance between two points. So, limbawa, meron ka... Maybe I should write something para mas... Uh, para hindi ako sanay na nagsasalita lang. Kailangan may sinusulat. Ano? I don't make silang pala to kasi clustering. Um... Okay, so uh, pwede natin unang tingnan yung uh, isang classification procedure kasi yung uh, diniscuss dun sa module uh, dun sa dun sa notes ay uh, isang application or saan ba ginagamit yung mga distances. Well, distances are very much used in classification problems. So sp specifically in two dimensions, right? So if you have say uh, a bunch of data, so 2D na lang yung illustration. Tapos meron ka rito mga bunch of data points. In classification algorithms, the idea is to train your uh, your algorithm or your program to classify data. All right? Kaya classification yung tawag. So meron ka ng, usually sa supervised learning to. So meron kang data points that you already know, uh, meron ka ng mga data that you already know to belong to several clusters or groups. Talimbawa, meron tayong group pink, tapos meron tayong group blue. Okay. Of course, you, you might have more data points or data, data groups, posibleng tatlong groups, apat na groups, etc. So the, the goal of classification algorithms is to predict to which group will a random test point or a given test data will belong to. Talimbawa, meron na akong data point X. Itong kulay black na to. Question. Team pink ba yan or team blue? So the, the several classification algorithms will answer this question for us. Pero ano nga to? Itong classification algorithms usually limited siya dun sa mga, dun sa mga already uh, classified data. So it's more of a supervised uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. Though pwede mo siyang uh, i-convert into a hybrid na dun sa training data, yung training data mode need not be classified at all, pero gagamit ka na ng clustering algorithm, which we will go to uh, in a moment or probably next meeting, para i-cluster na or i-group yung mga data points. Tapos pag nag-group na sila, saka ka ngayon gagamit ng classification algorithm. Okay? There are lots of uh, existing classification algorithms, pero yung pinakasimple ay yung tinatawag natin na KNN algorithm or the K nearest neighbor algorithm. So essentially, ang gagawin ng KNN algorithm ay titingnan niya along, uh, among all of the data points, the training data points that we have in our database. Titingnan niya sino yung K na pinakamalapit dun sa ating test points. All right? So K is a parameter in this algorithm. So you need to declare how many neighbor points will you consider. Kasi dun sa siguro, halimbawa, meron kang 1,000 data points or training data na nasa database mo na. Classified na sila, either team pink or team blue. Pipili ka ngayon, ano yung K parameter? Kasi sila yung magde-determine kung kanino magbe-belong yung test point natin na kulay black. So if you say uh, K is equal to 5, halimbawa, okay, the algorithm, uh, usually kung exhaustive yung algorithm, Ang gagawin ng algorithm ay pipiliin niya yung lima na pinakamalapit, kaya nga K nearest neighbor. Ano? Pipiliin niya yung limang pinakamalapit na kapitbahay ng test point natin. So depende kung ano yung distance. You can define your distance to be Hamming distance, cosine similarity. You can use uh, Manhattan distance, Euclidean distance, random Minkowski Minkowski distance, or the Chebyshev distance, or whatnot. Ikaw yung magde-decide anong classing distance and it usually depends on the application that you have. Well, kung dito, halimbawa, ito yung limang nearest neighbor niya. Ang mangyayari ngayon ay simple majority rule. Ganun yung decision, ganun yung decision step dito. Kung sino yung pinakamarami, kung ano yung classification ng pinakamarami dun sa mga neighbors niya, malamang, yun din yung, yun din yung ano, yun din yung characteristic o doon magbe-belong si black point. 
So here in our five nearest or in our five n n uh, algorithm here or illustration here, this point, the black point, is near three blue points, while it is only near to two pink points. So that means this algorithm will technically um, uh, will technically conclude that most probably the black point is team blue. Okay. Pero medyo nag-iiba yung, yung makukuha yung result if you use a different set of distance. Okay? Para napaka-simple niya, no? Uh, meron to mga advantages and mga disadvantages. So you can read the literature for their advantages or disadvantages. And that's what I'll test in the problem set corresponding to this part of the, uh, the course. All right? Uh, hindi na, kasi super simple lang ng algorithm, ano? So mas gusto ko makita yung insights niyo. Kasi once na, na clear na sa inyo kung ano yung tatahakin yung direction, kung anong klaseng distance yung gagamitin, uh, ano na siya, talagang black box lang. It's a train mo lang yung algorithm, you put your data there, and then you let it choose. Ano? Um, actually, ang isa lang ditong mahalaga ay ano dapat yung value ni K. Now, literature says that there is no hard and fast rule on choosing the value of K. Uh, Ano lang, uh, practicality, si K, piliin nyo to be odd para walang ties na magaganap. Kasi kung may tie, uulitin mo na naman yung algorithm. And the algorithm might be very costly because what the algorithm will do is that it will calculate the distance of the test point from all of the points in the data set. So if you have a million data points in your database, kukompute nung algorithm mo, ano yung distance nitong point na to at least if you are on an exhaustive search, ano, kukumpute niya yung distance ng test points sa lahat ng points dun sa yung database. Isi-save niya yon. Tapos, kukumpute niya yung pinakamaliit, yung k na pinakamaliit. So you decide what the value of k is. Tapos, i-compare niya, bibilangin niya ilan yung team blue, ilan yung team pink. Or this will also work if you have more data data groups. Ano? But essentially, that's the idea. So it's not a very exp uh, it's not a cheap procedure. So kaya kailangan right off the bat you have a good idea of what K is. Uh, literature suggests even though that there is no or that there are no uh, statistical uh, um, there is no st there are no st statistical evidence as to what the value of K should be or what the optimal value of K should be. Uh, rule of thumb, you try to use K equals the square root of the total number of points. Okay. Of course, the bigger K is, the more uh, insights that you will get, the more data will be involved in the in the decision process. But again, that comes at an expense. Mas humahaba yung algorithm. And this algorithm being exhaustive in nature, mahal na siya to begin with. So you don't want to involve unnecessary data points. Okay. Now, this is the naive one. This is the naive KNN algorithm. There are more hybrid KNN algorithm, but it's up to you to, to study na. Kapag ka nandun na kayo sa stage ng thesis na kailangan nyo ng mabilis na KNN. What we're after here would be the idea behind the method. Okay? So I guess we can play with the MATLAB code. Uh, at least mapapakita ko yung classification problem. Pero madali lang din naman to. Uh, how do I stop sharing? Okay. Uh, let me go back to my MATLAB screen over here. Okay, kailangan kong i-click yung share. Punta kay MATLAB. Okay, there you go. So, Irish data. Set up. So, isa sa mga maganda kay MATLAB, if you just go to, uh, if you just Google uh, classific uh, KNN algorithm MATLAB, dadaling kanya dun sa isang documentation page ni MATLAB para dun sa kanyang intrinsic uh, KNN routine. Tapos mayroon dong examples na pwede mong paglaruan, naka-describe kung, uh, kung ano yung mga data points, naka-describe kung ano yung mga uh, parameters, ano yung mga options na pwede mong ipasa dun sa algorithm. So you will really learn. Ang ganda ng documentation ni MATLAB. Right? So dito sa example natin ngayon, let me just clear my workspace para wala akong carry, carry over na variables. Let me just hit CLC. Let me close all of the figures that I have. Medyo marami na yata sila. All right. So in this particular example, let's see this. 
merong nakasave na. Pag nag-download kayo ng MATLAB, meron na siyang kasama ng documentation page at example pages. So meron na siyang data set na kasama. Right? One of them is the Fisher Irish data. Right? Itong Fisher Irish data, isa siyang data set consisting of sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width for 150 Irish sample and their species. So if you load this, so load ko lang siya, I highlight it and then I press F9. So maglo-load ngayon sa workspace ko yung Fish Irish na data set. Now makikita nyo, pag kinlik ko itong mesh, uh, itong mess, M-E-A-S, isa siyang 150 by 4 matrix, right? Each of the rows correspond to one Irish, uh, flower yata itong Irish, uh, dapat flower tong Irish, bawat isang specimen ng Irish. Tapos sa bawat isang Irish sample, minajure nila yung sepal length, sepal width, petal length, saka petal width. Yung mga measurements na yun, yun yung nasa column. So for instance, the first row here will correspond to one Irish specimen with 5.1 units yung sepal length, 3.5 units yung sepal width, uh, 1.4 yung petal length, and so on. Okay. Tapos ang idea natin ngayon ay gusto ko sanang mag-classify. Kapag ka kumuha ako ng isang particular um, particular sample, pag finid ko siya dito sa akin KNN algorithm, dapat sabihin sa akin ni KNN kung ano yung posibleng species ng Irish yung meron ako. Because this 150 measurements, dahil nga ito ay supervised, uh, supervised uh, uh, learning, machine learning uh, algorithm, dapat nakaspecify na rin yung species. So nung nag-collect ako ng 150 samples or specimen ng Irish, tinake note ko ano yung corresponding uh, species sa bawat isang specimen na yun. So gumawa ko dito ng isa or meron kasama si, uh, si, date, si Fisher Irish dataset na structure called species. Dito, ito yung database ng, spe uh, ng species ng bawat isang specimen dun sa mesh. So limbawa ito, unang entry ng species na, na, na structure ay setosa. Ibig sabihin, yung unang, yung measurement natin kanina, yung unang specimen na measure with this particular measurements, it belongs to the setosa the setosa variant or the setosa species of uh, Irish, all the way up to the 150 of them. Meron tatlong possible uh, uh, variants yung Irish uh, dito. Setosa, versicolor, at saka virginica. Ayun yung tatlong variants ng uh, Irish dito sa data set ni Matla. Right, so tingnan natin kung, tingnan, maglaro lang tayo. Tingnan natin kung ano yung itsura ng data set. So halimbawa ay say para uh, madali kasi magtingin kung two dimensions lang ano. So ang gagawin ko ay ipapascatter plot ko kay MATLAB. All right. Etong mga to. So I will ask MATLAB to create a group scatter plot. So yun yung command na G scatter. Gagawa siya ng scatter plot, the usual scatter plot that you have. The x axis will be populated by the first uh, column of the matrix mess. So, ibig sabihin lang nito, kinocall niya yung matrix na mess. Pag colon, ibig sabihin kukunin niya lahat ng entries dun sa dimension na yon. Ang first dimension ay rows. So, dahil may colon dun sa, dun sa place para sa rows, kukunin ni MATLAB lahat ng rows nung matrix na mess. Tapos, pero ang ipreserve niya lang ay yung first column. So, this guy, mess of uh, colon 1, Pagka niran ko yan, bibigay niya sa akin ay isang 150 by 1 matrix or vector. So, bawat isa pa rin tong, uh, specimen, pero yung first dimension lang, which represents the sepal length, yung ibibigay niya sa akin. And then, yun yung gusto ko maging x-axis. Tapos, ang gusto ko maging y-axis ng aking scatter plot ay yung second row column. Kukunin ko pa rin lahat ng rows para makuha ko yung all 150 measurements pero along the second column lang. So, kukunin ko ngayon as my Y components yung sepal width. Tapos, dahil naka-G-scatter yan, pwede kong i-declare kung anong group yung dalawang measurements na yon. So, remember, I am matching them with the species. So, titingnan niya. Yung nasa row 1 ba 
ay isang species na, ge- na nagbe-belong. Tapos kukulayan niya yan, lalagyan niya yan ng legend. Right? Tapos, sige, i-run natin tong figure na to to see if there is a correlation between the type of uh, the the species and the sepal and the the sepal the sepal length and the sepal width press f9 i'll get this figure so ito yung ibibigay sa akin ni g scatter so makita nyo na uh, if i plot the sepal length as a function of sepal width parang stand out yung mga setosa variants so ibig sabihin nakikita mo pa lang graphically ah posibleng magkakalump pala together yung mga setosa because they have this nice correlation between the sepal length and the sepal width. Pwede mo sabihin na, ah, maliit yung sepal length pero mataas yung sepal width, ibig sabihin malamang setosa yung variant niya. Pero magkakaproblema tayo to distinguish between the versicolor and the Virginia species. Kasi tingnan nyo dito, sila yung uh, orange and uh, the red uh, boxes here. Medyo magkakalapit pa rin sila. So what if my test point is somewhere, say, over here. Okay? Kung nandyan yung test point na gusto kong tingnan. So, posibleng hindi mag-work yung algorithm ko ng maayos kasi medyo magkasama pa yung uh, magkasama pa yung dalawang variants, yung versicolor at saka virginica. But if this is really, if these are the only measurements that you have, then you don't have any choice. But we have five dimensions. We have five measurements. Kaya mahalaga yung ano, yung parang bago ka mag-train ng data, tingnan mo muna, mag- gumawa ka muna ng pre-training analysis to see which variables really uh, really gives out the relationship or the uh, the relationship between those parameters and the classification that you want to attain, right? So here I I performed this uh, earlier and as suggested na rin ng documentation ano. So yung petal length at saka yung petal width sila yung mas magandang determinant nung, uh, nung variant. So, palitan ko lang yung X label. X label should be petal length. And then this should be the petal width. Okay. Oh, sorry. Petal. Then if I run this figure command again, okay, I will get this figure. Makita nyo ngayon, na, oh, parang mas madali pa lang mag-classify. Kapag ka... Uh, ang given variable sa atin ay petal length sa petal width because still in this uh, isolated isolated in the in the lower third quadrant of the figure nandiyan yung mga setosa tapos nandito sa medyo gitna yung mga versicolor kasi yung mga virginica and dito sila all right so we can play with this and say what will happen kapag ka meron tayong specific test points so pwede nating tingnan halimbawa sige um okay I will just store those measurements into a matrix X so yung mga measurements na gusto kong gamitin dun sa KNN analysis ko is save ko siya sa matrix as a matrix X so si X pa rin ay merong 150 columns one for each data point tapos yung mga columns niya ay yung mga measurements or yung mga components dun sa ating points. Kasi ngayon, you can forget about what the components mean. You can just think of them as the X component and the Y component of your data. Because after all, we'll just be computing distances. So pwedeng kalimutan mo na muna ano yung para saan yung X at saka yung Y components. So now, we have a, vec- uh, a matrix X consisting of 150 rows, one for each uh, specimen, and then each of the columns refers to a dimension or to a measurement for each of those uh, specimen. Tapos halimbawa, meron akong test point na X, ah, na Y. Ngayon, meron ako may pumunta sa akin na may daladalang specimen. Minesure ko yung kanyang petal length, 5 units. Kaya uh, minesure ko yung kanyang petal width, 1.45 units. Okay? So siya yung gagawin kong Y. Kasi si Y siya yung test point natin. Now, it could consist of more rows. In this particular case, meron lang akong isang specimen na gustong i-classify. Pero pwede niyo itong gawing multiple, uh, multiple rows. Pwede siyang uh, 100, pwede siyang 20 rows. Pero dapat parehas yung number of columns niya kay X. Okay? So, ganun lang yung magiging idea niya. 
And then kay line 13, pipiliin ko ano yung K. Diba magka-KNN tayo, ilang neighbors yung bibilangin ko. Well, ilang neighbors, say halimbawa, K, uh, square root of uh, the size of uh, the database. So meron na 150 rows, KX, yun yung ibibigay ng size X1. Kukunin ko yung square root nun. Dahil hindi naman ako sigurado na perfect square yung uh, yung uh, number of rows, kukunin ko yung ceiling. Uh, yung least, ano ba ito? Greatest integer less than or equal to. Basta kukunin ko yung ceiling ng square root na yun para maging integer siya. Okay? So yun yung gagawin ng line 13. Tapos yung line 15, ito na yung KNN search. Built-in kay MATLAB yung KNN search. So ano yung inputs kay KNN search? Pwedeng kunin mo, uh, unang input dapat yung database. Alright? These are your training data. Ito yung set ng training data mo. Si Y, ito yung test data mo. Ito yung gusto mong ipaklassify sa kanya. And then, if you you can run the KNN search by just those two parameters. Pwedeng kalimutan mo na yung susunod. Pero ang gagawin lang dito ni MATLAB, ang default na number of neighbors ay 1. So isang neighbor lang yung, yung nearest neighbor niya lang talaga ang hahanapin ni MATLAB. Pero we don't want that. So ang gagawin ko ay, ide-declare ko na gagamitin niya ay yung K neighbors na kinompute ko sa line 13. Para masabihan si MATLAB na kailangan little K number of neighbors yung i-consider niya, kailangan i-type niya to. Ano to eh? Name value pair. Name argument pair. So kailangan malaman ni MATLAB na, oh, magde-declare ako ng K value. So dapat apostrophe capital K, tapos comma, kasunod nun, kung ano yung value ni K na gusto niyong gamitin niya. Tapos you can pass on an additional parameter or additional option. Pwede kang mamili kung anong classing distance yung gusto mong gamitin. So probably for now, let's use the usual one. Uh, Euclidean distance. Uh, ito yung maganda sa 2022 version ni MATLAB. Binibigay niya na yung option. So pag na-declare ko na na distance parameter, yung gusto kong i-customize, bibigay niya sa akin yung options. And we have the different options here. You have Euclidean, you have uh, squared Euclidean, uh, you have city block, which is the Manhattan distance, all right? or the taxi cab distance, Shebyshev, uh, the Shebyshev distance, then Miskowski distance, ito yung... Uh, uh, arbitrary LP norm or LP distance. Marami pang iba, may Mahalanobis, cosine similarity, correlation, the Pearson R distance, the Spearman distance, the Hamming distance, the Jacker distance, and so on. Uh, gamitin muna natin yung usual default, Euclidean. Tapos, ipapaplot ko lang siya. Okay. I can share you, with you this code, so don't worry about this. Tapos, uh, it's almost time now, so I'll just go over the rest of the code later. But you can uh, you can uh, discern this on your own, decipher what each line of the code does. Pero I want to see how it runs. Okay. Okay. So, ito yung mga figures na nag-generate ko. Okay. So, unong figure na generate ko using this code is this one. So this will show my training data vis-a-vis -vis the test data that we have. Now, the test data is the black, uh, the one in black. So ito yung gusto kong i-classify. Pinili ko talaga yan para nandun sa medyo gitna nung uh, Versicolor at saka Virginica. Okay. Tapos ang k-value natin dito ay 13. So ang gagawin ng exhaustive search natin, KNN algorithm, pipiliin niya yung labing tatlong closest neighbors ni Blackpoint. Yun yung pinaplot ko sa figure 14. So sa figure 14, makikita natin dyan yung labing apat or labing tatlo na pinakamalalapit na neighbors nung test data natin. Well, uh, with respect to the L2 norm or the L2 distance, the Euclidean distance, uh, huwag niyong bilangin lang ito kasi posible nag-overlap yung data natin. So halimbawa, let me see. I'll hover here. Mm, yeah. Halimbawa, itong point na to. I hope you can see the point here. Uh, let me try to, yeah. Look at this point. Yung petal length ay 4.7, petal width ay 1.4. Merong walong observation points. Dun sa ver na versicolor variant siya. So, bawat isang point dito possibly mag-represent ng several data points. So, be careful when doing this. That's why I inserted a couple of lines in my code kasi ayoko namang mano-mano magbilang, ano? 
naglagay ako dyan ng mag, uh, output kung ano yung mode with respect to the species list. So maybe one homework for you is to take a look at this code and see what it does, but I'll uh, I'll talk about a little bit more about the details later. Pero bibilangin nito, kukunin niya yung mode dun sa species list, sino yung pinaka-frequent pinaka na nag-occur dun sa labing tatlong neighbors, uh, nearest neighbors ng ating data points. And it will tell me na, oh, number two yung, yung value niya, yung mode. E dun sa aking master list, pangala, uh, pangalawa dun sa listahan ko ng species ay versicolor. So that's why with respect to the L2 norm, most probably yung ating, uh, yung ating uh, test species will belong to the versicolor variant. Okay? Pero madaling mag-iba to, depende dun sa distance na gagamitin nyo. Halimbawa, instead na Euclidean distance, gamitin ko halimbawa ay cosine distance. Cosine distance, hit run. Kaya magandang lagi na may figure. So makita nyo, dito sa figure 6, ito yung binigay niya sa akin na anim. Na, uh, labing tatlong pinakamalapit na neighbors ng ating, uh, ating data point. Uh, understandably, na ganyan yung linya nila kasi remember, the cosine distance measures or the cosine similarity measures the cosine between the, between the vectors formed by the data points and the origin. So ang ginagawa niya, ito yung origin, bawat isang vector, uh, bawat isang point, consider niya sa vector Tapos, i-consider niya yung vector passing through the test point. Kukomputin niya yung angle na yan. Ito yung cosine distance. Alright? Kaya kung makita niyo, along a straight line, yung binigay sa atin na closest neighbors. Kasi nga, cosine distance so If you treat them as vectors in two dimensions, kukunin niya yung pinakamaliit yung angle between them. And you see, you have different 13 neighbors here. So the choice of the distance is very important. So dapat alam niyo sa application niyo, kung ano yung distance na kailangan yung gamitin. But luckily here, versicolor pa rin. Tama ba? Versicolor tayo kanya. Versicolor pa rin yung prediction natin. Kasi with, with respect to the cosine distance, versicolor pa rin yung pinaka, ay yung versicolor pa rin yung majority nung 13 closest neighbors niya. Then you can play with it. Uh, ano nga ba yung ginamit ko kanina na naiba yung result? Uh, let me see. Hindi ko alam mo yung Hamming, kung ano yung resulta ng Hamming. But uh, I don't think Hamming has a nice interpretation to this. But just for curiosity's sake, let's see. Tingnan nyo, parang walang wala talaga yung Hamming. All right? I I don't even know how Hamming was computed here. Kasi nga, ano siya, comparison between the bits dun sa in-store natin. Yeah. Esetosa, Versicolor, and uh, actually numerical yung data nga pala natin dito. Petal width and petal length. So there is an intrinsic MATLAB code na nag-compute ng Hamming distance. Though I don't know what the interpretation there. Pero dito, setosa na with respect to the to the Hamming distance. Ah, ano pa nga ba yung isa? Uh, Hamming, taxicab. Tingnan natin yung Chebyshev. Chebyshev. Iba nga ba yung bibigay sa akin ito? O, oh, versicolor pa rin yung binigay niya. Yung Shebyshev I with respect to the minimum or the yeah the minimum between uh differences in components and then you can play around it ano so actually nasayahan ako naubos yung oras ko kanina pag play with the data so nakalimutan ko ano yung possible ah balik ko yung Minskowski yung sa Minskowski kasi ikaw yung pipili kung ano yung exponent kung naalala niyo yung uh, yung formula ng LP distance ng LP norm Meron doong uh, exponent na kasama. Ang mga gusto kong i-consider yung L6 distance. Hindi L2, hindi L1. L6 distance yung gusto kong ipacompute. So, kukomputin niya yan. Ito yung nakuha niya. Tapos versicolor pa rin. Right? Kasi medyo related naman yung Euclidean distance sa uh, L6 distance. Ano? Medyo magkalapit sila. And they are equivalent actually. Right? So yun, uh, I'll upload this code. You can play with it. Although, halos kinapipaste ko lang naman to dun sa documentation ni MATLAB. But this is a nice uh, a nice starting point kung classification problems yung kailangan nyo. But again, the drawback of this, napaka-simple nito. Kaya lang mahal tong gawin kasi exhaustive yung search. 
I think there are some MATLAB uh, MATLAB uh, hybrids kung saan mas efficient yung paghahanap niya ng nearest neighbors. But one drawback of this problem on its own ay kailangan supervised learning siya. Dapat nakaklassify na. Alam nyo na yung coloring or yung grouping ng mga data. So paano kapag ka hindi mo pa alam yung kanilang classification? Meron ka lang 150 uh, specimen ng Irish. Tapos bago ka mapag-classify, kailangan mo munang i-group sila into Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Yun yung titingnan natin next time when we play with clustering methods. Dun sa clustering methods, titingin tayo paano nga ba uh, natin pwedeng i-group yung mga data. So it it could be the the springboard for uh, unsupervised classification algorithms. Kasi mag-feed ka lang ng data, ng training data, tapos siya na yung magka-classify, uh, tapos after niya mag-classify into groups, magbigay ka lang ng test point, kaya na natin i-determine kung saan group siya magbe-belong. Alright? But we'll do that next meeting. Uh, hopefully ako pa rin yung teacher. Hanggang dulo na yata ako. So we have lots of time to, to play with this. Ano? So we'll start with clustering algorithms next time. Now, please wait for the uh, problem set. Uh, problem set number two. I'll give it over the weekend. Tapusin ko siyang i-type. Kung hindi ko siya matapos ngayon, kasi ang haba nga ng explanation, bukas ko siya i-upload. Then uh, you'll have... Uh, kailan ang pa-deadline ni Sir Jomar? Tandaan nyo nga ba? December 21 ba ang pa-deadline ni Sir? Oh, December 21. Okay. So I should really give it to you over the weekend. And then you can uh, you can send me an email, you can chat me kung kailangan niyo ng ano ng, uh, ng tutorial or gusto niyo mag consultation. So as long as I'm free, I can meet with you. Pwede nga natin sanang gawin to na ano eh, na na parang guided exercise kung face to face lang sana no. Pwedeng isang Monday lahat tayo nakaupo sa MATLAB as uh, I mean sa sa Math Building Laboratory tapos nagso-solve tayo nito and having fun with it. Ano? Lalo na kung malaki yung data, kailangan natin ng malaking computer. Pwede sana tayong makiran sa, sa electrical engineering. Ano? Kasi, but anyway, so those are the what-ifs. Pero let's make the most out of the online setup. So just hit me up with an email if you want to set a consultation para rin ma, kung hindi klaro yung problem set number two ay matulungan ko kayo. Right? Uh, if Sir Jomar is willing to extend the deadline until the last day of the finals, okay din sa akin. Uh, kung marami kayo masyadong ginagawa. No? Pwede ko siyang kausapin na, sir, pwede yung deadline ko ay January 11 na. Kung papayag siya, ano, para, para mabawasan yung kailangan yung gawin. Kasi I saw the list that you need to do, medyo mahaba-haba pa siya. Alright? So with that, uh, sorry, overtime na ako ng 13 minutes. I am, uh, hopefully, nagsimula na kayo mag-dinner. Uh, mag but do you guys have any questions before we uh, before we go to the weekend? So kung wala na, thank you guys for your patience and joining me today. Uh, enjoy the weekend, uh, take some rest, then uh, pagbalik natin sa Monday, back to grind na uli. Ano? So thank you guys and have fun. Bye-bye. Thank you po, sir. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.